Yeah, that's why I say suicide prevention is more than just reactionary and symptoms, right? It was, it's it's everyday life. It's accesses, you know, dealing with racism, racial trauma, workplace stress, um, bias, you know, academia, you know, all these different things, stereotypes and stigmas. And I don't know, man, I just, I that'd be interesting to, to get a white male professional's take on yeah, how they view black men's mental health, or even if they haven't even thought about it. I've shared that information and done that, those those type of conversations with, you know, primarily in white dominated spaces, white men, white women. And I get, you know, usually some good feedback and I never thought about that, never researched that, or some don't care. But I don't care. Don't think it's a, it's a big of a deal, a big of a problem, or because it's not on their doorstep. That's only because I just like to be comfortable and we're teaching for three hours. <laughs> so, uh, and so I like to, you know, I know that's going to happen. So I'm going to make sure I'm comfortable, but also gives them a new take on what a professor looks like too, you know? So what are the name of these sneakers? These are Air Jordan ones, Co J P, Midnight Navy. And um, I stumbled upon these because I wanted them. And I went to the sneaker shop and um, traded some kicks in for these. Um, and I'm a Cowboys fan. Unfortunately, don't laugh. Nobody laugh. But they have Cowboys colors, too. So I was like, I love Navy Blue Silver. I'm a Giants fan. I don't think I could afford to laugh right now <laughs> this, at this venture in my life. Yeah. So, but uh, yeah. So yeah, even my, even my, my jumps here, yeah. and they get a lot of work. I um, do a lot of speak. I've done speaking engagement in these. You already saw my insole. That's what I put in my shoes. With these flat feet. Okay, that's ain't gonna hurt. That's too big. It's too big. Too big. You said it's too big. No, too big for it. What I'm trying to do. I be telling folks the toothbrushes for the details, the brushes for the larger parts. Yeah. So I ain't, I haven't used the brush on the sneakers in a while though. Toothbrush, again. He right there. For some reason, every Jordan one gets this little stain on its back heel. I don't know if anybody else experienced that. Every pair. Might be from the, the truck though. But how do you take your shoes off? Uh, no, I don't step on the back. I do pull my foot out though. I try to sit down and pull them off one by one before I go upstairs. But I get back in the flame. Let's play the. You can talk. You having to switch the frames. Yeah, <laughs> I get. I keep getting. I keep getting. I'm bad. I'm going back and forth. I'm like, man, it's going back and forth a lot lately. <laughs> All right, tell me about the importance of the barbershop. Man, the barbershop is important because that is one of the spaces where black men go to. Um, I would say um, have some camaraderie. There is some, uh, some, uh, let's see, relationship dynamics there, consistent relationship dynamics there with you and your barber, folks you might see in the shop. Um, Self-esteem boosts, to go in there to get cut and leave there with a renewed sense of how we feel. And it's also a, a staple and a pillar in the, com the black community for like community issues, social justice stuff, things like that. So it's one of those community pillars in the black community. It's also a space for homophobia. It is. 
It can be, for sure. And toxic masculinity, all that good stuff. So, and that needs to be addressed and dealt with appropriately for folks who are um, who are unaware, who are homophobic, transphobic, um, and need to be addressed in that space as well. So yeah. Recently, a couple years back, there was a mental health event in a barbershop space that you are a part of. Mm -hmm. Tell me the importance of that kind of event in that space. The first one? Or just in general? Uh, let's do the first one. Yeah, the first one was, um, uh, we started doing this barbershop talk to address, ironically, because um, it's Suicide Prevention Month, suicide, suicide in men. And the part was um, partnering with uh, local community service boards around um, my local community service board to help address men and uh, their topics. And so we said, okay, well, what better way to do to partner with a barbershop in a local area? I knew the owner of the barbershop. I used to go, go to his shop. Some of my good folks work in there. Um, and that's where we started to do that conversation. And um, we had had some answer, like I just went in there, talked about stuff for men, um, had resources in there. And it was also an opportunity to connect folks to, you know, the resources in the community so they know what to do if somebody was in a mental health crisis or substance abuse crisis. Um, and then that has blossomed into a lot more since doing that. That was like two years ago, actually. Close to a year. Yeah. What has that event space blossomed into? Um, that has blossomed into, um, I'm still doing it with a local barbershop in my area. And we have, you know, guys come in, we just talk about what's going on with us as black men or just men in general. Um, this resource base where some of the barbers are getting trained on how to communicate with their clients, point them in the right direction that they need some mental health support, substance abuse support. And one point we got the barbers trained in Narcan training. What's Narcan? Narcan. Um, it's the, uh, if somebody overdoses, um, you can um, revive them using this medicine to help them um, pretty much over, override the overdose. Mm -hmm. And so I thought that was important because um, folks are, you know, there's substance use still happening in the communities. Barbers are seeing it. Sometimes barbers are first line of defense um, in those spaces. Yeah. What is that? Listen, is this what you got? Open it up. Oh, yeah, look at you. Boom. Yeah. This what it is. The nasal spray for folks if they overdose. So it's important to have this, especially if you're in the community um, and doing work and stuff and training. So you want to make sure you have that and just be a, how to get trained on how to use it. You never know. So that's blossoming that. I'm also in my doctoral program and um, has been doing some research around the use of barbershop interventions to help address uh, mental health in black men as well. Seeing where we can go with that. It might be a capstone dissertation project. We'll see. <laughs> but yeah, that's what's been happening. How does one address mental health in black men? Address it in black men? Mm hmm Reducing the stigma around it, having a conversation, doing what Juice Jones and Get Home Safe have been doing for so many years, right? Bringing the content to the people. Um, but holding space for black men. So this, I, think we, I think we talked about this one time before. We expect brothers to have the emotional 
vocabulary to speak about what they're dealing with. But a lot of times brothers feel like they don't have a space to do so or nobody cares. They see vulnerability as a weakness. They don't want to be a burden. So we have the whole space for folks. Whole space for folks in that space as well. So that's what I think it means to do. As a man, what are the pressures that come with that kind of mission? As, as a black man, I mean, the base of that, or just a man in general? Uh, let's answer both. Are those two different answers? They are. As a man, it's tough because we're taught to just, you know, thug it out, stick it out, holding our emotions, provide. And we're not taught to express ourselves in that way. And then there's a layer of blackness as a black man in America that, you know, shows up and is layered from a cultural aspect due to, you know, tra generational traumas and things like that. And so um, it's heavy work. It's heavy work. It's, um, it can be uh, taxing and you could, you can always sometimes feel the weight of brothers when they finally let go. It's a very, very, very unique process um, that I've experienced with working with men um, that can be taxing. You gotta find a way to practice even more self-care when you're doing this type of work because you're dealing with folks who probably never told anybody what they're feeling or what, going, what their deepest, darkest secrets are, you know? And it'll, it'll show up if the space is, you know, trustworthy, if it's safe, if you can, you know, if they trust you and they have safety there, then they'll, it'll, it'll show up and talk and do it. What are your concerns with making a safe space in a public space? Um people being equipped to deal with what comes in there, right? So we can equip and we can provide the safe space, but we have to be aware of what possibly could happen. Somebody could be coming in there in a crisis. Somebody could be um, struggling. So they wanna make sure necessary resources are there just in case, or have licensed professionals, licensed uh, or crisis folks there as well that they can help get in contact with you know, luckily I'm able, cause I am a licensed you know, clinician. I can kind of maneuver that space well, but I always caution folks when doing that, yo, you want to make sure you got somebody licensed there or somebody, or at least a resource for crisis, substance and um, mental, you know? And I, you know what? And the other thing is also, I don't want Barber, the barbershop to be placed with the burden to address mental health as a whole. Tell me more. I want it to just be an app, just an alternative, not the end all be all, something like we talked about earlier, um, like therapy not being the end all be all. No, this is just an option. This is just a, a way to get out and do stuff. This is not your replacement for seeing a therapist, replacement to doing the work. Um, because a barbershop is there to cut your hair. <laughs> That's what it's there to do. So I don't want it to get overwhelmed and add another function um, that tries to replace what it's there for in the first place. That's the only apprehension I have sometimes when using that intervention as well. Do you find that men are more open to the topic of mental health and conversation in the barbershop as opposed to other places? I think it depends on settings, but I do think they're a little bit open there because they find it a safe space. Because they're talking about everything else. I'm talking about life, relationships, sports debates, things like that. And, um, and something, and then, you know, sometimes that it won't, might, man, it might not be the whole entire issue going out, but it seeps out just a little bit. Yeah, I'm going through this. And then everybody chimes in like, oh yeah, you know, that, 
Uh, we figured this out. Well, so I did that. You know, it comes out, you know, like subconsciously in a sense, but during that time period. So I do think that if there is a trusted voice and there is like safety there within that barber, within that barbershop space, then yeah, they will. But I think if you can create safety and trust in a lot of spaces, whether it's the workplace and the community, um, you know, things like that, then it, then rumors will show up and talk and have the conversation. But if there's not no safety there, then yeah, it's not gonna work. It's not gonna work. Psychological safety, meaning that I can be vulnerable and express myself about being demonized, weaponized, or somebody gonna take me to a hospital or something like that. So lately, men have been voicing that they don't feel included in the mental health space and the mental health discussion, especially when it comes to content creation. Yeah. Why do you think that may be? I don't know. I don't know, Juice. We've been talking about men with mental health for years. Um, I don't know. Has somebody expressed? Have you got a direct quote why they felt like that? The space of mental health is dominated by women. Naturally. Naturally. Just by the numbers. Yeah. So because the space of mental health is dominated by women, most things that you see are either going to have the face of women or the perspective of women just by curation and design. Oh, yeah. Right. Yeah. So you're throwing a mental health event in a barbershop is not something that you'd see when it comes to mental health. You think of an office, you think of aromas and smells, you think of something very relaxed. Yeah. Men like heavier things in general. Football. Yeah. <laughs> right. Basketball. Right. Sports. Action. Right. More reaction than thinking. Right. And the way the content has been curated, even though it is correct, I could see how someone that's new to the space could look at the space and ask, well, is this for me or is this for the mistakes that I have made in the past? Does that make sense? Clarify for that mistakes in the past, Pete. Um going to therapy as a man does mean that you may have to come face to face with something that you've done in the past to someone gotcha. which in a lot of cases is a woman for women going to therapy going to therapy I think there's a higher probability that her issue was either a man or someone has done something to her and because of that the way the content is curated on social media it's how do I set better boundaries from what has happened to me in life? Whether it's through trauma, whether it's through experience, or whether it's just through general, that was never right to begin with, but it's been accepted behavior in society. And this also goes back to our last conversation when we now have to touch on the topic of hierarchy and men are really sensitive when it comes to the readjusting of the per perspective of hierarchy. Right. Right. A lot of words, but I think that got to the point. Yeah, a lot of words. There you go with that lotus stuff. You, do, yeah, you, do you, you ask. You, you, you ask the question. Stuff. I was like, well, this this is you, what I've observed. Because you go. When I saw when I saw your reaction, I was there like, all right, he may not be seeing it on his side, <laughs> but I'm hearing it a lot on uh, my side but i also get the blue pill red pill and other people's stuff in my thing yeah and i'm like well just because they exist and they're not a part of the mental health space doesn't mean their opinion's valid but i'm usually trying to key in on okay for the person that feels this way i want to hear your perspective on what that might be it's hard i mean because i think and maybe because it's proximity, right? Because I, I have a rack of black male therapists or black male content creators who mm -hmm. focus a lot on black mental health. I just went to a conference up in New York that last year, no, this past year, that 
focus strictly on black men mental health yeah um so i think that you know my algorithm looks a lot different um and i would say that man i think once you follow one person or find the information from one mm -hmm. one content creator around black mental black men's mental health you'll find the rest of us yeah and it'll start to be imposed in there but it is a, i mean it's a women dominated space the work is and so some of that is going to be more so women dominated or women topics but then you do have some good women therapists out there who recognize the the deficiency in the content for uh, men around mental health and they address it as well so then it's also about okay well do you want to hear that from that woman because that's a that's a that's a thing too um and it's a women dominated space we don't have a lot of black male clinicians or male mental health professionals in general. So to ask of something that is inherently really not there, the supply is not there, it, you're gonna have to get it from somewhere else, unfortunately. Um, and and that, that's what kinda is the, 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 the fact of that kinda makes things kinda tricky in that moment. Cause we don't have a lot of folks to make that content. So, I mean, I, I don't know. That's interesting. I haven't heard that. I haven't heard that. It might just be two different, you know, layers and algorithms. Did you want to clean the bottom of those? You had some gum on the bottom of those. You know, I just, there's, there's gum on the bottom of one. It's like real sticky. Yeah. I don't want to do, I want to do that here. It's like, I need a thing to pry that out. That's disgusting. Bruin. And the faces that are being made. <laughs> Look at that low right there. The faces that they cannot you see cannot that see were that. being made. Yeah. Uh. <laughs> uh. So, I mean, you know, unfortunately, we, we're trying, man. Mm -hmm. We're trying to make more content for us. We're trying to do that work, man. Um, and, but it's unfortunate. And it's not because the will is in there. Yeah. <laughs> it's just the supply isn't is prevalent. Yeah. You know, yeah. about, what, 10 of us that make content from it in the dmv area me you care bache uh Aaron. dr b lakeith mm -hmm. so what's that including the two names you said that's about seven altogether yep um there's black men cry too my homies uh content in new york but she's been taking a break because she started a business shout out to cat shout out to cat um who else who's who's that guy that made content as of late the color for his platform is like light green purple and pink my homie was just looking at his content yesterday we got Black Men Hill out of Philly. Yeah, yeah, that's who it is. Black oh, Men Hill. Black Men Hill. Um, we also have uh, what's the name of our brother up there in New York? Aaron. Aaron. Aaron Mueller. Yeah. Is that is that it? No, there's there's like three other people. I think. We got my folks, uh, hip hop social work Chris Scott, mm -hmm. uh, Doctor James Bell, X yeah, Hatters. Hip used to make content, but he slowed down drastically. Yeah, but he's more been behind the scenes working on a lot of things. Mm -hmm. Shout out to Doctor Hip. Shout out to Hip. I mean, and, and again, that's just mm -hmm. that's just you know the ones that are active in the content creation space, active and licensed, active and licensed. Yeah, yeah. except yeah. for me. Yeah, so you know that's that's what we got to work with, and that's you know, it. that's really it for us. We got Rashawn out there too, Rashawn Miller. Yeah, and he's been around for a while. But that's, I mean, active license that do content creation is a very specialized three. Because <laughs> everybody can't make content. Everybody don't want to do content. I didn't realize I was, so, I was part of such a, a specialized group of folks. Yeah. Damn. So that's why I was saying, like, I don't know. I can't speak to it because, like, my algorithm is filled with those individuals. Mm -hmm. Um, I think my algorithm is purposely not filled with those individuals because I can't help those people. That makes sense. Gotcha. I could work with them and we're a part of the same conglomerate of who are we looking to help? Yeah. But my content 
is meant to reach the opinion that hasn't been touched yet yeah or the perspective that when i look at the landscape i don't hear enough of this right now right and that's that's very unpopular because that means what you're working on is naturally not no one's really going to be interested in that until a couple of months to years from then yeah from when you touch it yeah it's 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 had a, been brought up yeah. as yet yeah um like my platform could technically be called the build it's the building <laughs> of something yeah 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 so i mean that's that's why it's hard to answer that question because it's like mm -hmm. you know i i i know everybody that make that content but mm -hmm. to have all three license mm -hmm. you know man yeah <laughs> makes content and black and black and black i need more white therapists on the content creation side honestly i i want to hear the opinion i want to see hey you don't think there might be something wrong with that for example right <laughs> so jory my host yeah i think she was in memphis if i'm not mistaken when she was in the process of becoming a doctor. Yeah. And she told me about this particular story about the treatment of a black boy who showed up DOA. Mm. And the people that she was working with, who were her classmates that were working in the hospital, took the liberty of, well, we do have these requirements to fill. So let's keep him on the machine to give keep him alive as we take care of these requirements. Just, just let that sink in. We, since I've done this work, that may be one of the most disgusting stories I've heard. And then after everything was said and done, they put him in a room with a white sheet over his face and then let his mother know for her to come and get him and her have her moment by herself. And... I think of these isolating moments and I think of these moments of how black people are treated yep. as simply objects with lack of humanity, yep. whether they're alive or not alive. Mm -hmm. And in the framing of black men, especially with it being Suicide Awareness Month, I really wonder what are we missing? Because the space that you've made, not only is that the space that's necessary, I think of the general spaces that were once made safe that no longer exist, mm -hmm. that no one has replaced with anything supplementary. Yeah. yeah. I think that's the right word. Yeah, that's why I say suicide prevention is more than just reactionary and symptoms, right? It was, it's, it's everyday life. It's accesses you know, dealing with racism, racial trauma, workplace stress, um, bias, you know, academia, you know, all these different things, stereotypes and stigmas. And I don't know, man, I just, I, that'd be interesting to, to get a white male professionals take on yeah, how they view black men's mental health, or even if they haven't even thought about it, I've shared that information and done that, those, those type of conversations with, you know, primarily in white dominated spaces, white men, white women. And I get, you know, usually some good feedback and I never thought about that, never researched that, or some don't care. Flat out, don't care. Don't think it's a, it's a big of a deal, a big of a problem, or cause it's not on their doorstep, you know? So, I, that'd be interesting. That'd be really interesting if you could. And the topics that you mentioned of suicide prevention, mm -hmm. if you could, and if you would, I'd like for you to pick three of those topics that are untraditional that we don't think about and give me an example of how, how does that relate to suicide prevention outside of just, Hey, you're suffering from ideations. You should talk to a therapist. Income inequality. Okay. Let's talk about that. Black folks or black men not making enough money to make ends meet to afford rent to afford housing, to live in a stable housing, right? Mm -hmm. So I can't, I don't make enough, I work 40 hours a week, 50 hours a week, but I don't make enough money to pay my rent and buy groceries, right? That could make somebody want to, you know, leave his oath and be suicidal, right? 
might mean have no diagnosis with depression or anxiety at all. But the stresses of life have caused me to think this way, right? And I've been there. I've been there. Like, I've been there as a provider and somebody is a new father, was a new father and making money, right? But it was, you know, it was check to check. It was hard to make ends meet, right? And, and just really had to start having the thoughts about what if I am not here anymore? You know, what if I just drive my vehicle off the road? Because I'm too stressed out. I had no formal diagnosis at all. I ain't had a history of suicide ideations. You know what I'm saying? But those thoughts did creep up. And then that's, you know, even in my privilege as a black man, educated black man, and have access to these things. Um, so imagine somebody who is trying to make ends meet here in D.C., right? And overcoming whatever they overcame and they still can't afford rent, can't afford groceries, can't afford Wi-Fi. You know, can't get around, drive around. You know, things like that. So, that's something that has nothing to do with I'm depressed. This is the reality of the fact of the day. I can't take care of what I need to take care of. Why Barbara still being here? So, there is a trigger warning on that. Hopefully, we put on that just in case. Got you. But, but yeah. All right, so financial insecurity. Mm -hmm. What would the next example be? Housing. Because, you know, rent is super high right now and it's impossible. It's, it's super high to afford a mortgage to buy a house. I mean, it's at the point that people entertain the chase glitch just to <laughs> to even out. Yes, to fit because we think that that might be a moment, a moment that yeah. I can get, I can finally I get one up, get up and yeah. get good. Yeah. Uh, white people don't have to deal with that. I mean, white people do have to deal with poverty and things that they, you know, struggling financially. But when you look at the numbers, the numbers, we're behind on that income, income, income inequality, right? We're behind on that. We're behind on home ownership. We're behind on these things. And that's by design, by design, all the way back to slavery and Jim Crow. We're still feeling the effects of that, you know? Um, and so that's where we are. Folks are, oh, no, you know, everything's good. Now it's not the 60s, it's not the 50s. Well, it was, you had the head start and benefited from everything going forward. We still try to keep up. <laughs> we try to build it back, you know? Um, and so I think that's one thing. Um, financial insecurity, income inequality, housing status, um, access to insurance. We didn't get a chance to talk about that earlier. Insurance to afford medical treatment. Insurance to afford, you know, mental health treatment, right? Insurance to afford, afford that I have, you know, good prescription glasses so I can see and, and do what I need to do. You know, uh, dental work, you know what I'm saying? Like, that's one, that's not a barrier. Why bother, right? Because I don't have access to none of this. I can't get well, can't get treatment. That has nothing to do with the this mental health piece of it, but there's no diagnosis there. And you're not going to be able to out-therapize your mortgage. And you can't afford your mortgage. There's no therapeutic intervention to say, hey, this treatment goal, let's figure out ways to afford your mortgage. It's not, you know. So... I meant to say that earlier, but I had a um, can't out there, but I ain't got no money. <laughs> if I ain't got no money, I got no money. You know what I'm saying? I need some money. Can this therapy, CBT, <laughs> can you thought, feelings, and emotions, uh, 2000? <laughs> if you can't thought, feelings, and emotions, 2000, then we got a problem. It ain't gonna work. You know? Oh, well, you know, let's figure out how we can you know, address your stress. Get some deep breathing. There's some mindfulness. No, I'm broke. Bills do. You know what I'm saying? So that's that's one. That's that's one or two. It's one to two. 
I probably should uh, do the thing on East and bring these back a little bit. But I like the little bit of vintageness in them. All right, so what's the third? What do you say? Said financial, it's care. Financial. Income. Said housing. Housing. Um, I think insurance is one. Yeah, it's insurance, yeah. But we need to do a deep dive on that insurance thought because you had a lot to say in that text about insurance. Oh, yeah. That moment. Yeah. And, and I had a lot to say about it because I felt as though I, I, I feel like I have good insurance, but there are some folks who have insurance that it costs just as much <laughs> to have the insurance than it would if they didn't have insurance. And that limits lack of care and access to care, mental, physical, dental, you know, eyes, whatever you need, specialty. And so um, I was just, you know, saying that I recognize my privilege in that of having good insurance and having a health savings account. Um, and I just got that this year, just ne never really understanding it or how it works and um, to afford these things. But I thought about the people who who couldn't. And I, Did you ever say the name of these sinkers? Did I? No, these, oh, these are Concord 11s. Yeah. One of my holy grails, favorite shoes of all time. And this is the 2011 pair. 2019. Somewhere between, it's not the 2011 pair, put it like the 2012 pair. Cause it got 45 right here. And it's a high cut, high level. So it's one of that 2018, 2019, I can't remember. Don't come for me sneakerheads. I don't feel like remembering dates today. <laughs> Which one I just clean? That must be this one. What is so clean you can't even tell. <laughs> must be that one. And this one. Yeah. Um, so that insurance piece, man. And it, I was, you know, I think that, and then you talk about like out of pocket expenses and affording copays and stuff like that. Um, some people can't afford that either. Um, but then like, say for example, for like the therapy piece, like we talked about like affording therapy is therapy or privilege and people can afford, how can people afford therapy? And then you have the situation where um, healthcare insurance, insurance companies not reimbursing therapy, uh, therapists, uh, a livable wage for the services that they provide, which then affects their well being and their business or practice and stuff like that. So it's a cycle, and it's like, who's wrong? I'm gonna go look at the system, the insurance company, you know, and figure, you know, figuring that out, you know, and, and how can we get equal amounts of insurance for everybody that's get the same amount of services covered for everybody that there's no lack and reimbursing our healthcare professionals and therapists a livable wage that makes sense for the services they provide you know so then we get into these conversations all the time me and juice then we got in depth a lot more in our sessions but the, the, here comes the nuances and like I said earlier, even our time that we were talking about sometimes, man, you know, there might not be a solution, right? There might just be time we need to sit and just sit with somebody, sit with the situation. But then the other times that we need to address these systems because they hold the power and the power structure. There's no reason that, there's no reason you and me can't go out here and get a, medical eval you know what i'm saying and just check our, med our medical stuff that should not cost us an arm and leg to do that there's no reason that you should not be able to go get your eyes checked and not cost an arm and leg get your teeth checked not cost an arm and leg anything else you want to get there's no reason that we shouldn't be able to do be able to do that and i think it's the same thing for therapy too like we should be able to go talk about the stresses of life and not feel like it's an arm and a leg or somebody's going to, um, you know, it's going to cost us astronomical rate, but at the same time, it's specialized services too. So insurance should be covering that. 
<laughs> you know what I'm saying? They should be covering that. You know. But that's just the understanding of mental health and we're still trying to really look like what mental health is and what it means and how it impacts our daily living. Which then goes to the suicide prevention piece. Now, Wait a second. My new definition of suicide prevention is that there should be tears of understanding between a crisis and an emergency. Tell me about that. So right now we're in a mental health crisis. Yes. As a community, we've become of mental health where it plays a part. What can we do to approach the crisis of mental health in terms of the undereducation or the misunderstanding of? And what are the resources that we can one day explore if we have the money and the funds and the people to hopefully make a better situation for whatever is going on mentally in our community. Mm -hmm. An emergency, 911. <laughs> <laughs> That's so funny. Yeah. That's so clear, Blade. Make it Blade, dude. An emergency, call the cops. Call 911. <laughs> yes. Hey, hey, this is out of control. Call I don't know why I thought I had your back like I did. One. Call 911. Please. Right? It's so funny. Why we can go serious and they good. <laughs> 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 it's good. Yeah. Yeah. I like it. I like it. Oh, yeah. That's the difference between a crisis and an emergency. Mm hmm. Mm hmm. I think sometimes we don't have to call 911 for emergency, though, either. No, no, no. I, I hear you. Yeah. I, I hear that. Right. Or a crisis, too. Sometimes. Well, sometimes. It depends. Here's my theory on this, right? I okay, think okay, I'm listening. That we need mm -hmm. community. See that that's that that's that's already a hurt place right now. But there's a there's a tears though. Uh, the community side. The healthcare like a, side. Now you sound like a video game. Policies. <laughs> tears of play. Tears. You know, say levels, <laughs> right? I think all of that needs to work in unison. Mm -hmm. Right? Instead of isolating and you know, isolating each other mm -hmm. in these different silos. Because I would like to work, I would like to know that I have representation and understanding mm -hmm. if I have to walk through the yeah. ER. Yeah. In the hospital. Yeah. But it might not be a crisis or emergency level. I should be able to get that from community. Let me frame this for you. Gentrification breaks a community. Right. That's what we've seen. Mm -hmm. D.C. is a great example of that. Yeah. People being pushed out of their homes. Right. New neighbors. Are you here to be my neighbor? Are you here to replace my neighbor? Mm -hmm. People that are more of the like mindedness that it's OK to pass your neighbor every day and not know, hey, which house did that person come out of? Yeah. What's their name? <laughs> right. Who your mama? Right. We your we your we'll mama stay. stay. We we'll your daddy, daddy stay. stay. We we'll your grandma, grandma stay. <laughs> <laughs> you get what I'm saying? <laughs> So to call upon a community that has practiced not being community is very hard in this newer generation and world that we're existing in. Who's 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 at fault for the infrastructure? Like who's the infrastructure? That system. Yeah, exactly. So I'm not asking them to give us community. I'm talking about for us. Oh, I get that. I get the yeah. choice. But the reality is now that you would have to interact with people that you've practiced not interacting with or right. ignoring or not picking up their mail or watching someone steal their packages and not caring or seeing someone broke into their car and passing them and say, couldn't be me though. True. So what your answer is correct. Don't get me wrong, but our answers versus the reality of what we're coming to understand about what's going on now really not only changes the approach but it it changes it changes the amount of time it takes for the community to catch up to the thing that we're suggesting as practitioners so I you and i we I create you you're supposed to believe i believe in people man you still I, believe in community you're I, supposed to like I, that's, I, that's not wrong yeah i, I think that mm -hmm. we we we've, we've missed that yeah right you know, I'm not point. I'm not even gonna point blame. Saying who, who, yeah. what, whatever. 
we've missed that mm -hmm. and, and and that's where we have to get back to and we can create it because i've seen community created we are the people we the people get home safe uh barbershop talks that i'm doing group chats i've met folks you know, create a community via technology that I've never met in person till today. Raising risers. Raising risers. Yeah, that's like that. platform. We got to get back to that. Yeah. And that could be separate from the system. Mm -hmm. We just have to protect it differently. Yeah. Because historically, yeah. you know what happens. Yes. You feel what I'm saying? So we just have to live and learn from what we, you know, historically mm -hmm. and figure out new approaches and interventions on how to create community in different ways. Yeah. And... That's 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 what it is. We we you were absolutely right. I think it's from a generational aspect. Mm -hmm. We've gotten away from it. Yeah. You know what I'm saying? But we can get back to it. So we need to practice community. And when I say we, I'm not talking about you and I. We're building community. We're making space for community. We're visiting we community. Build community, yeah. We're practicing community. Right. right. We need other facilitations where the community is simply learning again to be community uh -huh. and then still we don't get to stop doing this thing anymore no matter what's happening across the board uh -huh. Uh -huh. and that way when we start implementing what does you okay over there i feel like you're having a shoe apart something happened uh that happened this just this 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 Sega A M was went off. I okay, was crushing it. So. Oh, oh, yeah, oh, yeah. oh! You need to apologize to that. Yeah, it's okay, man. Okay, all right, sorry. Just don't care. Don't do this. So when when we start to implement suicide prevention as a community, what does that actually look like on the community front? Because next year we're going to talk about suicide prevention. The year after that we're going to talk about suicide prevention. The year after that year after that year we're going to talk about suicide prevention. It really comes down to. No, we should be talking about solutions by that time. Oh, one would hope, but I mean, we're talking about mm -hmm. solutions of people getting money back from slavery at this time, and that's still a broader discussion, mm -hmm. right? So, after the community practices being community, and after we come up with action items, which is what we're going to do next year and the year after, mm -hmm. who checks in on the action item, right? Us. Us. Who checks in on what was the effect of the action item? Because we're not coming up with action items just to have an action item. I think the point of an action item is, does this work? And if it works, who else do we pass this on to, to say, hey, community, we should try this. My folks over here did it. It worked. This is how the numbers went down. Or when this happened, this is what making space for people that are actually dealing with suicidal thoughts looks like instead of demonizing mm -hmm. their struggle mm -hmm. how do we really create an environment that tells these people that are struggling not only are we here for you if it happens tomorrow we'll make a space for you you have to try and work with us please because we want you to see tomorrow as much as you used to want to also we we value the uh we evaluated by the effectiveness of the, mm -hmm. of the ones who we are affecting like so we are providing an intervention to yeah is it working yeah that's how we would i would say conceptualize it and see if it's effective or not mm -hmm. and then we build off of that as we go forward and then yeah. hopefully we build and pass the baton which mm -hmm. we have a hard time doing sometimes yeah Letting go, of power. letting go of power, yeah. and giving it to the other folks and, and or the next generation so they can do the same thing and do more. I believe this all starts with empathy, but there needs to be a balance of empathy and execution. Empathy, execution, and balance and yeah. accountability. Yeah. So, and it's it's a heavy lift. It is. Yeah. It's, it's 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 a heavy lift. It's got to be strategic. Yeah. You got to have, you can't just have one person doing it all. Mm -hmm. Again, going back to community, I think it can be done. And in that way, we have something to fall back on when we go into these systems, you know, and we have a well-rounded, you know, uh, approach to it. And it's tough. It's going to be tough work. I don't think it's going to happen within the next five, ten years, but it's going to be built out over, over time. Yeah, I'm not, I'm yeah. not focused on when is it happening. I'm focused on are we working on it. Yeah, provide. You, you know, I say this to you all the time. Hey, man, always make sure to keep the focus, the focus. Mm -hmm. Right. The only reason I'm able to focus is because at some point in my life, whether it was yesterday or today, I care. Yeah. You feel what I'm saying? And caring looks different. 
So sometimes I categorize people by what their caring looks like. And I'm like, those are the people that needs to work together because their caring looks similar to each other. And we need to let them do what they're doing over there as we do what we're doing over here. Yeah. Dr. Hip's version of caring in the background, your version of caring and my version of caring in the forefront. Jory's version of caring, it's in the forefront, but she does stuff in the background and facilitates events, yeah. facilitates the kids. And I think it's our responsibility between you and what you're doing as a professor, Forest Therapeutics out there in Temple Hills, Get Home Safe over here in DC, what Jory is doing with Raising Risers in Southeast, I'm more on the Northeast side, and just really figuring out and us coming together and being like, okay, so you're doing this, when do you need help and what does that look like? Mm -hmm. Like I have an event that Jory's doing, a uh, dad event, daddy daughter's event that I wanna invite you to, but it's in like a week or two. But it's like a movie joint, right? Yeah, yeah, sitting yeah. down and just dad sitting down watching movies with the kids. And I think you guys might be talking. I'm not sure. But it's just facilitating dads with daughters watching movies and dads meeting the other dads with daughters. Right. And just that space and how necessary that is because that is what community is. Absolutely. Absolutely. And then we have the whole space as well for folks who like might be tired. <laughs> you yeah. know what I mean? Like, okay, well, they, they don't show up is because, like, it, it's not just because they don't want to come. It's like, life is life, too. You know what I'm saying? So, I mean, I get it. Mm -hmm. And I'm also in the practice right now, too, Juice, of getting out the forefront. Like, because I don't always need to be in the forefront. Yeah. You know what I'm saying? So let's let's figure out ways to put other people in the forefront that are just as passionate, creative, share the same vision. Mm -hmm. And like you said earlier, I'm going to give them the, the tool. Yeah. And I think I'm doing that with my students and my supervisees. Like, I'm gonna prepare y'all, get y'all acclimated to, you know, the work that I'll pass the baton to y'all pretty much. Mm -hmm. And I'm gonna play the background, right? Yeah. Cause I've already laid the foundation. I gave y'all what y'all need to do. Yeah. And hopefully you will do greater with that. Oh God. Yeah. So, yeah. And I think uh, one thing I'm working on is I'm bringing more women to the forefront. That's good. Of the men discussion because Something moves me when I see women that are so inclined to continue to make space for men. And I always ask myself, okay, where are the men around that woman to prop her up in the things that she's doing, whether it's for us or not? Right. That's why bringing Jory on as a host, that was easy for me. Pediatrician, you're already doing these panels, making space for men. Come here. Cat in New York, if she ever needs anything, yo, what's up? I hit her up. I'm actually supposed to call her today to check in after this. Yeah. Cause like those are my folks. They're already doing stuff for us. Right. They're for the men. I'm like, I right, they're doing it for us. They're trying to understand us. They're making space for us to talk. When is it gonna be our turns to do it for them? Why are we waiting to be told? Sure. You don't want to help the person that helps you. Yeah. Yeah. Wasn't life better once they started helping you? Think about that. You don't want to figure out ways to maintain that and improve that. Exactly. And ask them, hey, where do you want to go after this? Because there has to be something that's not me. Yeah. Yeah. And I think that's probably one of the hardest parts of the work that we do, looking past yourself and understanding how blanketed and how large the work that we're trying to do when it comes to prevention, when it comes to mental health, when it comes to the quality of life. And understanding that, hey, man, the work it's going to take to do this is probably not as simple as I thought it was going to be in 2018 when this started. And it also ain't about you. <sighs> ain't about you. A little less me, a little more we. Mm -hmm. Ain't about you. And that's why we start building a community because a lot of people out there just doing it for the sake of just about them. Yeah. And, and that's where lines get blurred stuff resources get mixed mm -hmm. folks don't trust because yeah. people are doing it for the wrong reasons facts it's not about you it's never about you yeah so i i just try to keep that same model man i just give give out teach provide mm -hmm. and then and, and hopefully you know and i don't, I don't I ain't really looking for nothing hand out or you know plaque for it or yeah i'm securing myself to say you know what I, I did it. I, I gave it gave it freely. I did what I needed to do. I'm going going to the house and, and watching watching games. Yep. Show the family. Yep. Raise go my be, kids. Go be a Cowboys fan. You go be a Cowboys fan. Be yep. a, be a husband. You know, yep. and, and watch these blades of grass go outside. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> half inch, half inch, half inch. Yeah, you know? yeah. So, yeah. yeah, man. I think these are good to go, bro. I think these are all right. Well, I think you need to put both sneakers on the table because you know what time it is because it's currently five oh five. Yes, sir. One. 
I'm an advocate for mental health and this is a day in my shoes and you need to check your mentals, B. <laughs> <laughs> Alright, I'ma just take that. That was great. That was, that was good right there. <laughs> I'm good with that. <laughs> <laughs>